Well, first of all, I apologize. I have little or no voice. I hope I can be heard. Uh, I talked this morning and all of a sudden it went away. So I think it's my usual fall introduction to the winter when my sinuses go berserk. So I hope you can hear me. Um, first of all, and I want to uh, make very clear one thing as I speak with you. I am an academic. My job is, one of my jobs is to do research. And so what I'm talking to you about today is what I have done in research. I did not write the Common Core Standards. I have no horse in that race in terms of this, these particular, this version of those standards. I do in the research which led to the development of those Common Core Standards. But I want to make very clear that I'm only an advocate because I believe that those standards written by others actually uh, do lead us in the right direction for our children. And that's what I'd like to share with you. Let me remind all of you as to why it is that we need these new standards. You know, just less than a year ago, about December of a year ago, the 2012 PISA results came out. Now, for those of you that don't know, PISA is an international group. It's the OECD, the organization of the 34 wealthiest nations in the world. All of the countries we compete with economically and are partners of us in all kinds of policy issues. That group gives a test every three years. They just gave one in mathematics and it came out last December. That result, that test showed that we were like about 26th out of the 34 top wealthy nations in the world. Hardly a position we would want to be in. Hardly a position that helps us to maintain our economic advantage in the world. And those results are very consistent with all the results that preceded it from a study called TIMS to other versions of PISA. We are not doing very well. Our own national assessment tells us that we're not doing very well. Only about 25% of our students are really highly proficient in mathematics by the time they leave high school. 25%. Whoops. 25%. That's all. And so this is the base in which we have to think about the Common Core. Now, what's the history of it? I'll let me help you understand that. And I would like you to understand that I'm not recounting history. I lived it. I was in it. So it's a first-hand accounting of the history that led to this common core set of standards. In 1995, a study called the Third International Math and Science Study, TIMS, was done. That study showed how poorly we were doing at that point. But what made that study very different was that as a part of it, we actually studied what it was that those other nations did. So one part of that study looked at textbooks and standards from all of these 40 plus countries and said, okay, what is it they teach at which grade levels and for what reasons? So it's an empirically driven study, not just somebody's opinion. It was a real study looking firsthand at the materials in, in 20 some languages. Okay? And what we did is to analyze the, those standards. Now out of that work, we then did an analysis. I'm a statistician by training, so we invented a way of summarizing those data. And we came up with what we call the A+, as an international benchmark. We took the top achieving countries and said, all right, what do the majority, two-thirds or more, do at each grade level? What topics do they teach? At this point, it's probably really important to establish one clear fact. The standards that we're talking about, including the Common Core, only say what content should be learned at which grades. That's all the standards do. They're not about how you teach it. They're not about a style of pedagogy. They have nothing to do with any of that. It's not about which books you should use. It's, that's all left to teachers and their, and their role as professionals. The standards simply say, for example, at third grade, you should know the multiplication tables up through five, something like that. It's a very clear statement of what should be learned at which grade levels. So we analyzed that in all these countries. And we looked at this criterion of two-thirds. And we came up with a benchmark, an international benchmark. It was about at that time that governors, like Governor Engler, were looking for standards 
that would give this state a better educational system. Because governors realized, unlike the, the people in Washington, that this was important for their state's economic growth. And so they really wanted to find a benchmark. Well, this work actually gave us a benchmark. For the first time, it wasn't rhetoric. It became a possible, re it, was, it became a reality, a possible reality, because we knew what those countries whose kids did so well, what they studied at which grades, okay? So it's not ideology. It's not somebody's theory. It's the reality of what we saw among the countries we studied. And so that led to this benchmark. Well, in the study and development of that benchmark, we came up with three principles which drove and differentiated the top achieving country standards from the rest of the world, including ours. It was focused. Each grade focused on a small number of topics, taught them well, so they didn't have to be repeated year after year after year. How many of you parents and have children and you sat at the dining room table or, and said to them, well, what did you do in math today? And their response oftentimes is the same, just the same stuff. You probably thought they might be blowing you off. They aren't. That's what the problem is. In the U.S., the curriculum kept teaching the same stuff year after year after year. But to such a shallow extent, they already forgot it, so it had to be repeated. So focus. Secondly, uh, it was rigor. While the rest of the world's seventh and eighth grade was about algebra and geometry, our kids were doing arithmetic. Still, ratios, percentages, divisions, things of that sort. We were two years behind the rest of the kids' world, the rest of the kids in the world. Two years. Now, unless you believe somehow that we're genetically flawed in this country and our kids, why would our kids be two years behind what other kids are studying? There's no logic to that. But there was a lot of people who had very fancy theories as to why that was, because kids can't learn abstract things like algebra. My response was always, well, how come the rest of the kids in the rest of the world can do it if our kids can't do it? Doesn't make sense. So the last principle was coherence. It's a very simple principle. Mathematics is very logical. There are certain topics you need to know before you know other ones. And there's a progression across the grades. Sounds obvious, doesn't it? But if you would look at what we, done, we did in this country for a long time, there was no coherence. We taught things in funny orders. We taught things at the same time, even though one had to precede the other topic. So we were teaching very incoherently the mathematics we taught, which makes it very difficult for kids. Math is a very logical thing. If you get the deep principles of it, all of it fits together. The best illustration of this is fractions. Kids have a terrible time with fractions. Why? One reason is when we introduced it in this country, we put a pie on the board, a circle, and cut it in halves or fourths, and we told them that's what fractions are. Now, that's not wrong. That is a use of a fraction. But what a fraction is, it's a number. It fits on the number line. So kids very early get a number, zero, one, two. And then you ask them, what's between zero and one? Well, that's where your fractions come in, between all the whole numbers. It's part of the same number system. That's how it's done in the rest of the world. Why is that important? Because it all fits together. Most kids think they finally figured out how to add and subtract and multiply whole numbers, then all of a sudden the, the teachers jerk with them and they put these fractions up and everything's different. It's not. Not if you understand the basic undergirding principles of math. It's that story that we need to get kids to be able to actually work with mathematics, not memorize it. And then if you forget it, then you're, 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 you're in trouble. Okay? What's true in in, for a person like myself that has degrees in mathematics and a PhD in statistics, is I'll forget a lot of this stuff. But you know what? I can remember enough to figure out and reprove to myself what I need to do. That's when you can use mathematics. And it's not just for engineers and scientists or mathematicians. The world is increasingly complexly driven by mathematics. All the games these kids lo love to play, it, this all magic. It's all, not magic, logic. And it's all mathematics. That's the basis behind that programming. And so, 
So that's where we want to take the kids. So all that work coming up, it took 10 years before finally somebody decided to build on that work and write these standards. Now along that way, there were numerous government governors from both sides of the coin. This isn't a Republican, a Democrat, a liberal, a conservative issue. Along that history, one of the, some of the staunchest supporters was Governor Hunt of North Carolina, a Democrat. Governor Engler, who still is as the head of the, uh, um, what's it called, the, uh, not the Chamber of Commerce, the other one for business, the Business Roundtable. And Governor uh, Tommy Thompson across the water in Wisconsin. Uh, Tom Ridge, a governor in Pennsylvania. Half of uh, Governor J George W. Bush's administration were all ardent governors supporting this, whom I could call and get online to get this stuff lined up. But not much happened. Then came the time when the Common Core Standards were developed. And those were developed about 2010, they came out. They were not written by the federal government. The federal government had absolutely nothing to do with the writing of those standards. I was there. I wasn't an author, but I was part of that process. And so they were written by a set of people who had no connection to government at all. They were mathematicians who should write the standards for kids around mathematics, together with a person who was a math educator himself. So that then developed those standards, and that's what we ended up then along 40-some states adopting. Now, you've probably heard that some states are pulling out. It's true. But let me tell you, Indiana, the south of us, pulled out. But then the governor had a group of people sit down and write the new standards. I analyzed those standards the way I analyzed all the standards from the international work we did. And guess what? They're the same. And Alaska adopted the Alaskan standards. They didn't want to be part of the Common Core standards. Guess what? They put the name Alaska on top of the Common Core standards. So there's a lot of this going on as they develop. Why do they end up with something similar? Because it's very logical. It's empirically driven by the study of these 40-some nations. This is why it makes sense for us to do. Why should we go our own way when if we were the stars, perhaps that would make sense, but we're not. We're 26th. All those countries that are above us, they have standards that look very much like what the new Common Core standards look like. That's why I'm an advocate, because they meet the standards that I developed in that original research long before there was even the inkling of having Common Core standards. And so what we have now, I can tell you, again, because I did this research, it is published in a journal, if you want to check it out. Basically, if you compare the new Common Core Standards to the international benchmark I refer to, it matches it quite well, about 90% consistent. It's not a copy. I don't believe any nation should copy somebody else's standards. But it's based on those principles, and it comes to be about 90% matched with the, the international benchmark. So from that point of view, in answer to the question, are we moving in the right direction, is pretty resoundingly yes. Unless again we think we have to be different from the rest of the world and go at odds with the rest of the world. No businessman would do that, or businesswoman. They benchmark themselves constantly against their competition, be they here in the US or some other nation. So all that we have done is to give education a benchmark that they can look against. And that's what was done. And they're pretty good. Would I have changed some things? Yeah, I think a few places they missed. A few places aren't perfect. There are no, there's probably no such thing as perfect standards. But they're good. They match that benchmark. And the key, the key characteristics of focus, they're less per grade in terms of the coherence, they're logically put together, and in terms of the, uh, the, the rigor, they're, they're demanding. Middle school is now like the rest of the world. It's about algebra and geometry. Yeah, it's tough. Yeah, some parents are gonna complain because it's different. Yeah, it is different from what you did when you were a kid and I was a kid. But what's wrong with that? Does that make it bad? No, it means we're taking our kids at a level where they can compete with the rest of the world's kids. The rest of the world's kids are getting this. 
the poor kids, the rich kids, it doesn't matter. That's what their standards call for in these other nations. And so we're simply raising the bar for our kids. I'll add a point here. That's one goal of the Common Core, but there's another. The words Common Core. What it means is all kids get the same opportunities, at least up through high school, the first part of high school. And that's been a problem with our system. It's very inequitable. Children in different communities get different amounts of math and different topics, leading to different performances, leading to gaps in what they know, leading to gaps that contribute to the, uh, to the salary gap and the gap we talk about in our country right now, the big, huge gap between certain pe groups of people and other groups of people. That's contributed to by this gap we have had in this country for a long time in education. We have always prided ourselves as a very demo democratic nation. We're opportunity for all. It's the American dream, right? That if you work hard, take care of your opportunities, you can rise in life. Well, that's not been the reality of schooling. It's actually been a tilted playing field, simply helping the kids that live in certain communities more than in other communities. And I'm not talking the most extreme, like downtown Detroit versus the suburbs around here. I'm talking about just differences between Holland and Sagatuck, or the next one, and what's Grand Haven. Those differences exist and have existed. The Common Core is trying to both raise the standard and make the opportunities available for all kids. A second point as to why it's a, why it's a good idea. I did an analysis. Now, there's no, there are no data that can confirm at this point whether this works or not. But we have 50 state standards before 2010. Every state had its own set of standards. Some of those standards are closer to the Common Core than others. Okay, that's just a reality. So I figured, what if I analyze that and develop a statistical indicator that shows, ah, thank you, I locked my keys in my car and I just saw them, which means I can get home tonight. <laughs> ah, now I'm revved up. Um, and I also lost my place. Um, so, thank you. So, um, what was it? Standards of the individual standards. There, thank you. This is the big walla, and I blew it almost. All right. So we took those, and I, did a, I developed a statistical technique. This also is published in a journal. So it's been refereed, and it's not ideology. It's real empirical work. I took and measured how far each state, each of the 50 states, how far their standards were from the Common Core. The logic being that if the Common Core was moving us in the right direction, those states whose standards were the closest to the Common Core should do better on our own national assessment, the one the kids always take. Like the, the MEEP, there's a NAEP, which is the national test. Every state has to take that test. Okay? So, that's what I did, and for, did a formal statistical analysis of it. And in fact, it's true. Those states whose standards were the closest to the Common Core performed better on the, our own national assessment. Does that prove anything like it's, that guarantees the, the Common Core is going to be better? No. I'm a statistician. I know the difference. What it does say is that, there's, that we're moving in the right direction. It gives hope. Both of those facts, the fact that we're lined up in our standards with the rest of the world, the top achieving countries, and in our own country, the states that were the closest are doing the best. That's positive evidence that we're moving at least in the right direction. So you see, I don't understand why this has gotten political. This is about our kids. This is about giving them a shot in life. This is an ideology. If you know anything about mathematics and you look at those standards, it makes sense. It's logical. It's the way it fits together. So the political side, I don't even, well, I do understand it, unfortunately. But if you look just at those standards, I do not understand it. People say, let's get rid of them. Want to know what I like to say right back? What are you going to replace them with? You want to go back to what we had? That's doing us real well, isn't it? 26 out of 34. Hey, so where is, the, where is the place to go? These are solidly driven mathematical ideas. It has nothing to do with ideology. 
Two plus two is still four. 10 times six is still 60. Three X plus something is equal to something else is solved the same way. It's the same math. Why do parents get riled? Because the way that it's taught, not the pedagogy, the mathematical way that it's taught, is kids get to see that underlying theme that I'm talking about. So they can connect what they're doing. It makes more sense. And so if they forget a fact, they can figure it out themselves because they have that background. That's the only real difference. It is totally agnostic with respect to style. Any teacher, anywhere, no matter where they lecture, they have groups, it doesn't matter. The standards don't speak to that. It just says kids by the end of third grade should know bing, 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 bing. And it teaches it to them in a way that when they go to fourth grade, that builds right into that, which builds into the next grade and makes sense. See, math doesn't make a lot of sense unless you see that underlying story. Because if you don't see that, it's a lot of memorization, for gosh sakes. The minute you learn something, they teach you something new. Then they go off on exponents. Then they go off on scientific notation. Then they do this. Then they take functions. You get the idea of a linear function, then all of a sudden they make a curve in it. And you're dealing with an exponential function. But if you understand the basics, it all fits together. It progresses naturally. And that's what the Common Core Standards do. Let me just take about a, a couple minutes more and just say something about some of the myths that have risen about this. Then we have plenty of time for questions, should you have any, and I hope you do. Um, what are some of the myths that have arisen here? Uh, one of them is that this is a federal takeover. This is not true. You know, the biggest mistake that was made, and you can quote me on this, I don't care, was when Arne Duncan stuck his nose in this. Everything was going well until he put his face in this and attached it to the race to the top. Because that gave some people the notion that this is federally driven. It wasn't. I was there. I watched the process. It was done by these math people with the Governor's Association and the Chief State School Officers. <coughs> You know, the Flanagan, the people that do that, and the governors. They were the supporting driving force. They wanted a new set of standards. I told you earlier, early on, the best support I had were the governors. I talked in Washington to the, to the, the Senate and the Congress and all that when that results first came out. It, it never got anywhere because there was all politics. You talk to the governors. One of the great things, you should, I wish you could all see it. You put a bunch of governors in a room and you take the press away. They know how to work together. They talk to each other. They figure out solutions because state problems are somewhat similar. And that's what was driving a lot of this force. So it was not any kind of federal takeover. It has nothing to do, remember, standards only say teach this topic at this grade level. That's all they do. That could stop a lot of conversations because there's a mythology of what they do and don't do. That's all they do. Now different people have attached different purposes to the standards. Some states want to use it to evaluate teachers. But that's not the common core. We've always had standards. There's always something you're going to be evaluated against. So if they're common core, that's not an issue of the common core. That's a use thereof. Another one is the tests coming up. Our legislature's in the middle of that. You imagine that? A bunch of politicians trying to decide what kind of tests should be given in school. Now there's a real clever idea. And when they're, so we're in a mess right now with that issue. That's another issue. Does that, that's not the common core. That's a testing policy. All of this is getting run together so people pick whatever their, their ideology, ideology stick is and use it. But the standards, keep in mind, only say, this is what you should learn at this grade level. That's all. And suggested in a coherently progressive way. So that's one big myth. Um, and a, another myth that comes around is that, um, that uh, this d eliminates local school control. Well, there's no comment about that. It just says not how you teach it, in what building do you teach it, how do the kids get to school, what do they do around it. That's local control, always has been. The rest of the world, that's all their standards do to, as well. Teachers and the local communities drive most of the local policy. 
We're not unique in that respect. We think we are, but we're really not. But basically, again, it just specifies what's to be taught at which grade levels. It's not trying to take any kind of local control or parent control. I mean, I wonder what parents that come to sometimes in meetings and say, well, you're taking away my control. What control is that? You know, how do they homeschool them? They buy a book. And the book tells them what to cover and what page, blah, 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 blah. Who's controlling it? That book. Would you rather have that book driving it? Half of which are really bad. No, three-fourths, 90% are actually bad. I've analyzed them, that's a statement of fact. Um, and basically, they're terrible. Boy, there's an industry that gets away with a horrible abuse, charging the school districts tons of money for, well, you're a school board people, you know this. Textbooks cost a huge amount of money. And this is a very technical term. They all suck really badly. They're terrible. They really are. And, and so, once again, that's a myth that sits out there. The only probably honest, contra the honest um, uh, criticism is that some have said there could be better. There's parts where they could be improved. To which I say, you're absolutely right. Standards are a living document. We ought to do like the rest of the world. Every five years or so, they refine their standards, make some changes. It's, it's a document that lives. It goes on. And the, I find that a sensible comment. Nobody has any objections to that, not the authors of it or anything else. So that's where we are. The two biggest impediments to making this work, standards are only a piece of paper. The teachers have to deliver it. The two big impediments are the teacher's background. It's not their fault. They were trained. They did what they were told. They were certified by the state in which they went to college. The faults lie there. The state has control of certification. So don't whine at things about why the teachers are the way they are. The state sets the standards by which teachers are certified. You want better teachers, raise the certification level. I support that. I think it ought to be. And the colleges and uh, universities that prepare the teachers need to do a better job of it. There's no question about that. The second biggest impediment, I already gave you that bottom line, are the textbooks. They don't line up with the Common Core. Even though they say they do, they don't. Again, it's a statement of fact. We've analyzed it. We're about to release the study very shortly. So that's where we are. That's why I think it's foolish. That's why I think it's a very important policy decision in every state in this, in this country of ours. This is a chance to give our kids a real shot at life with understanding an important <coughs> literacy, mathematical literacy. It's really important for their lives. And this is not attempting to impose some kind of secret mythology into their brains. It's just helping them to learn math in a better way than we have in this country for so very long. It's the right direction. We have evidence to say that. So I would say help the teachers in your districts. Help support the work that needs to be done. It's the right direction. I thank you.